Hello and welcome to Everyday Arrow. Today I'll be looking at the story of the YB-49. The YB-49 had a rocky development, fierce controversy, and was ultimately deemed to be a failure. However, recently with the B-2 and the B-21, the YB-49 proved to be simultaneously ahead and behind its time. In 1941, Europe appeared to be on the verge of falling to the Germans, so the U.S. Army Air Force felt the need for a long-range bomber. Northrop, Consolidated Aircraft, and Boeing were invited to submit proposals for a bomber with a speed of 450 miles per hour and a range of 6,000 miles. Northrop responded with the XB-35, which was later the YB-49, a flying wing designed to minimize drag by eliminating the tail and fuselage. The idea of the flying wing had some previous exploration in Europe. Britain first explored a flying wing in 1908 with the D-8, but it wasn't very successful. In Germany, the Horton brothers took the idea of the flying wing much further and actually had some success, especially with the HO-229. Jack Northrop, however, took the idea the furthest. In 1929, Northrop produced the N1M, which was quite successful and led to the Air Corps requesting a design study. Northrop's next flying wing platform was the XB-35, which had contra-rotating propellers, drag rudders, and elevons. Elevons are ailerons and elevators combined, and drag rudders control the yaw of the aircraft by inducing drag and are typically placed far out on the wing for increased effectiveness. In 1945, the Air Corps ordered two XB-35s, but the production experienced numerous delays, poor results, and the need for the bomber was quickly diminishing. The Air Corps canceled production but kept the program alive for testing. The XB-35 first took flight in June of 1946, three years late and four times over budget. Then, the XB-35 experienced its most major setback, the development of the atomic bomb. This bomb was massive, around 10,000 pounds, which was a larger payload than the XB-35 could even carry. This load, however, was not too much for their competitor, the Convair XB-36. Northrop then changed the XB-35 by adding eight jet engines and vertical fins, designating it the YB-49. This first flew in October 1947, but despite having a higher top speed, the YB-49 had reduced range and payload capacity due to the extra weight of the jet engines. Another major shortcoming was its stability. YB-49 test pilot General Robert L. Cardenas described a stall testing flight in the YB-49. He said, quote, I leveled the YB-49 at 20,000 feet, pulled back on the throttles, and waited for it to stop flying. Because most of the shutter you get in a stall comes from the tail, not the wing, I knew I wouldn't get a big shutter. Sure enough, when the tailless airplane quit flying, instead of the normal shutter just before the nose drops, I experienced a violent pitched forward into a negative G tumble, which pulled my rear end out of the seat. In a microsecond, I realized I had no aerodynamic flow over any control surface that would allow me to recover. It was as if you took a nice, crisp, clean dollar bill out and let it go. It would go spinning around its center, the engineers later called it a lateral roll and said I had encountered inertial coupling. One of the YB-49 also crashed on June 5, 1948, hitting the ground upside down. The plane was too unstable to be an effective bomber. Convair's XB-36 won as it was simply a better bomber, but in September of 1948, the Air Force made a contract for 30 variant YB-49s called the RB-49A. However, just a few months later, in December of 1948, President Truman ordered cuts to the defense budget, and Air Force officers decided that this contract was to be among the ones cut. In January 1949, Northrop was told to stop production of the RB-49 except for testing. Later, President Truman was in attendance at an air show outside of Washington, D.C., and was amazed by the YB-49. And he said, quote, I think we ought to buy some and he even arranged for one to fly past the Capitol. He was unaware that this was the exact plane he just cut funding for. Despite this post-mortem interest from Truman, the YB-49 was not revived. The Air Force magazine describes the demise of the program as, quote, Of the 15 Northrop flying wing platforms produced, several crashed and a number of others, some of them stripped shells, were destroyed as surplus. Two YB-49s survived the cancellation. One broke in two when a landing gear collapsed in a high-speed taxi run test in 1950 and was destroyed. The other was preserved for testing, flew 13 times, 
was put into storage and finally scrapped in 1953. And so the story of the YB-49 was over. That is until 30 years later, when Northrop suddenly emerged with accusations that accused the Air Force of cutting the YB-49 because Northrop refused to merge companies with Convair. Jack Northrop claimed that in a meeting in June of 1948, he was instructed to merge by the Air Force, and that he was told, quote, you'll be goddamn sorry if you don't. Reporter Cleet Roberts then added to the confusion by publishing a story about the YB-49 beating the B-36 in a, quote, fly-off competition, and that the Air Force had selected the YB-49. The Los Angeles Times then piled on, saying that the Air Force awarded Northrop a contract for 35 planes with the possibility of producing over 200. Francis J. Baker, a former Air Force officer and a manager in the B-2 program, sorted out these stories. He found that the initial meeting where the Air Force demanded Northrop to merge was actually a meeting initiated by Northrop. The secretary of the Air Force that was accused of making the threat said that Northrop came to him and told him that their company would be in trouble if they didn't win the contract. He knew that the Air Force was leaning towards the XB-36, so he suggested Northrop merge with Convair. Baker also found that the stories about the fly-off and the Air Force contract were false. In the end, he showed that Northrop's claims didn't hold any weight, kind of like their plane. And so the story of the YB-49 was over. That is, until in the 80s, radar cross-section was suddenly extremely important for avoiding radar detection. During its testing in the 1940s, the YB-49 was shown to have a small radar cross-section, but that hadn't mattered until now. Northrop created the B-2 bomber, which looks very similar to the YB-49, even having the exact same wingspan. But the B-2 is much more technologically advanced. The B-2 uses fly-by-wire, which handles instability much better than a human pilot can manage. While the B-2 is not simply a direct upgrade of the YB-49, it still made huge leaps from the foundation that the YB-49 built. The YB-49 is such a roller coaster of a story, because every time you think it's gone, it just comes back. For its time, the YB-49 provided exactly what wasn't needed. It was slow, had poor range and payload capacity, and was very unstable, and it was bested by the Convair B-36 Peacemaker. For modern times, though, the YB-49 proved to have a useful design and a low radar cross-section, and stability issues could be solved with modern technology, proving it to be simultaneously behind and ahead of its time. So while the YB-49 bombed, so did the B-2. <laughs> Before I get into the top five hardest images of the YB-49 and XB-35, here's a quote from the Air Force magazine that I found interesting. The 1953 movie, War of the Worlds, used Northrop YB-49 test footage to depict the dropping of an atomic bomb on Martian invaders. Oblivious to the irony that the demise of the YB-49 was due in part to its inability to carry the atomic bomb. All right, now let's get into the top five hardest images of the YB-49 and XB-35. Okay, I've compiled my top five hardest images of the XB-35 and the YB-49. So in at number five, we have this image of the XB-35 in flight. Um, and I picked this one because this plane does not look like it's capable of flight. I can't believe this thing flew, especially in the 40s. Th this thing looks like it should drop like a rock. And at number four, we have a YB-49 for a pretty similar reason. This does not look like anything that should be able to fly. This looks like a machine that should never leave like one inch off the ground. The B-2, they had to make like a computer to be able to fly it. They flew this thing in the 40s with just like a guy in the cockpit. Imagine that. Imagine a person flying a plane. Crazy. Um, next is this picture of the XB-35 with some people standing around for scale. Again, this does not look like a real aircraft. I can't believe this existed. Um, it looks like if you ask ChatGPT to generate an image of an aircraft, and it just like forgot the fuselage. And next we have a YB-49. You can tell it's a YB-49 because of the vertical tail back behind the two landing gear there. And we have a man up by the front landing gear that just shows the scale and the size of this plane. Um, and also the size of that landing gear. You can see why that one broke in half when the landing gear failed upon landing. 
Um, and last, we have a YB49 taking off. Just I don't want to call these uh, emissions awesome, but it 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 looks cool. Okay, this is the top five hardest images, not the top five most environmentally friendly images. I'm not sure that they even cared about efficiency back then. Obviously, we care now, but I can't deny that I love this picture. If you made it this far in the video, thank you so much for watching. Typically, when I make these videos, I use a variety of sources, but this video was very different. The main source I used for this was definitely the Air Force magazine from airandspaceforces.com. The majority of the information in this video comes directly from there. It has an amazing article that's a great read, and I would definitely recommend it if you're interested in this subject at all. Also, the Smithsonian Air and Space Magazine has an article by the YB-49 test pilot, General Robert L. Cardenas. that is also just incredible to read. I highly recommend that you go check out these two sources because there's just so much more that I just couldn't fit into this video. I'll be posting more videos soon. Again, thank you so much for watching. Bye.